Good evening and welcome to the 302nd meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series uh, about comics, illustration, animation, and other text image work. We're sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is Deb Sokolow, and she's a Chicago-based artist working with text and image, whose work I first came across while editing the 2017 edition of Best American Comics. Uh, she has exhibited at the Van Abba Museum in the Netherlands, the Drawing Center in New York City, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia, and in a Matrix exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, Connecticut. Her works are included in the permanent collections of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, uh, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Uh, she's been reviewed in the New York Times, the Washington Post, artforum.com, Hyperallergic, and the Brooklyn Rail. She is an associate professor of instruction in the Department of Art Theory and Practice at Northwestern University and is represented by Western Exhibitions in Chicago. Her talk tonight is entitled, Mr. J Kim Jong-un attempts to kidnap Mr. Michael Jordan and the blurry line between fact and fiction. So take it away. Wow, um, yep. thank you, thank you, Ben. Um, that was wonderful, thank you. Uh, and thank you for for inviting me. Um, give me one second. I'm about to share my screen. I just need to um, get this ready. Okay. So let's see here. Okay. And so here we go. Um, Yes, uh, this is the title of the talk. Uh, first off, uh, thanks for coming. And um, I'm joining you, uh, yes, in Chicago uh, from my home, which is in uh, supposedly a former warehouse um, built in 1925, fireproof warehouse to store wine, which always makes me think that that can't possibly be true because that was during prohibition and was anyone storing wine officially storing wine during prohibition I don't know so I, I like to think that maybe my my building was instead used to store bodies or something I don't know what was there a lot of in 1925 in Chicago so anyway um welcome I'm going to um talk about yes the blurry line between fact and fiction um over the last 15 years, um, the drawings and the books I've been making have consistently walked that line uh, while speculating with humor and criticality, at least my attempt at criticality on the hidden, less savory aspects of politics and organizations and individuals in pow power. Um, so I initially thought I would um, start with this, talking about this. Um, I thought I would start with the 2005 call I received from a Chicago Tribune reporter about the then in progress 48 foot long drawing I was making about pirates and mob bribe money and then Chicago mayor Richard M. Daly, which resulted in this blurb in the Chicago Tribune. I thought that was the starting place for this talk, but I think I actually, I'll get back to this. I think I actually, actually go back further in time to talk about um, an incident that happened in at McDonald's when I was 12. Every artist has their, their genesis story or origin story and mine occurred at a Washington DC McDonald's near Embassy Row. Uh, in 1986, my mother and I, we witnessed what seemed like a highly suspicious briefcase exchange occurring in the men's bathroom. And uh, we weren't in the men's bathroom, we were outside the men's bathroom. I wanna clarify, uh, I was eating chicken McNuggets with dipping sauces. 
And we watched a man walk into the men's bathroom carrying a briefcase. Um, and a different man then exited the men's bathroom carrying that same briefcase. And then the first man exited the bathroom without the briefcase. So it seemed we were sure there was some sort of briefcase exchange. And this was the first time I can recall feeling like I was catching a glimpse into some sort of sinister parallel world of intrigue. Um, and, and, and all of this happening inside what to me as a kid felt like a very familiar environment, McDonald's. Um, so 24 years later after the incident, I ended up making an artist a book about it. Um, and looking back on it, I realized that my mother and I didn't necessarily know 100% that it was a brief kiss exchange between two individuals. Um, it was just a very strong assumption. The first man might have accidentally left his briefcase in the bathroom and then maybe that explains why he came out of the bathroom empty-handed and maybe the second man might have walked into the bathroom and saw the briefcase and brought it out to give it to a McDonald's employee for the lost and found. So perhaps, um, or perhaps my mother was reading so many spy novels at that time and many taking place in Washington DC during the year that we were living there. And I was certainly reading a lot of Nancy Drew detective stories and maybe we were both, uh, we both so wanted it to be a briefcase exchange that our memory of some kind of incident happening was unintentionally fabricated. Uh, but that being said, I'm 99% sure it was a briefcase exchange. Um, and I should also point out that my mother around this time was arrested while demonstrating in front of the Soviet embassy. And so we both, my mother and I, we both had the Cold War and detective stories and spies and the Soviet embassy on our minds around the time of the McDonald's incident. And incidentally, sometimes I wonder, speaking of McDonald's, sometimes I do wonder what else happen in, happens inside McDonald's restaurants. So, you know, when the seasonal McRib sandwich uh, comes out on the menu as a code for something else. Um, but I'm going to move on and talk about my old apartment building. Um, the idea that a conclusion about something could come from the combination of observation and some research and some guesswork and some outright fiction, that combination um, led to the first large scale text and image drawings I started making at the tail end of grad school in Chicago at the School of Art Institute in 2004. Um, and the drawings were filled with observations and theories about the other people living in this apartment building. Um, uh, on the right are the tenants mailboxes in the building and I'd like to point out that uh, while I never opened anyone else's mail it was hard. Um, it was hard not to see what was inside when a neighbor's mailbox lid was open. So you can't help but but see what's in the mailbox um, while you're getting your own mail, um, but I never opened anything. Um, so, so this is this is what I started making my, the first sort of text and image work about about this building. But I was also uh, at the time I was reading this um, Georges Perec's uh, Life: A User's Manual, and this is a, a novel from 1978. Uh, it's a novel of interwoven stories based on the lives of the inhabitants of a fictitious Parisian apartment block. Uh, the 99 chapters of the 600 page novel move around the floor plan of the building describing the rooms and stairwell and telling the stories of the inhabitants and i was also looking at the diagrammatic drawings of mark lombardi who kept meticulous files on individuals and organizational entities involved in in government politics finance intelligence organized crime terrorism money laundering uh, lobbying and organized religion Lombardi was able to connect some of these various individuals and entities through financial records and tracking who was funding who and through which intermediaries, all from combing Associated Press and Reuters published news stories. Um, I, I love this idea, this work from Mark Lombardi, but I didn't want to be Mark Lombardi. Uh, Mark Lombardi is all about the research, was all about the research, rest in peace. Um, I think at the time I was more, and I still am more interested in telling stories that connect the dots in a way that embellishes truth or fills in the blanks with questionable evidence so that it would be harder to define uh, so-called fact from fiction. So uh, this is the one of the first large scale drawings I've ever made. This was filled with observations and theories about the other people living in my apartment building. Um, 
I remember showing this piece to my parents uh, at the grad exhibition when I was graduating from School of the Art Institute. My mother, uh, the reader of spy thrillers and mystery novels, whispers, Debbie, if someone in your building is dealing meth, you need to go to the police. And my dad overheard this and said, Sandra, it's just a work of fiction. And, you know, both of these conclusions were not wrong. <laughs> there's definitely truth to both of those. Um, so there's, you know, various stories about some of the people in this building. Uh, there was a strange smell and I maybe attributed it to a sacrificial goat uh, coming from one of the other apartment um, apartments in the building. There was uh, the plumber, a guy who always tried to stop me uh, while I was on the stairs and always wanted to talk about um, toilets and and so on. So I just assumed that he had, uh, that all his furniture was made up of toilets, except for a, a big bed in the middle of his apartment that would uh, rotate 365 degrees because he was sort of a ladies man. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I'm going to move on to this one. This is a sequel. This is also right out of grad school. Um, just making these big drawings of, you know, color pencil, pen, um, trying, attempting to use a, a level uh, nine feet long, five feet this way. Um, at one point, uh, this one's also about my building and the block. At one point, large piles of dirt and mud started appearing without an explanation behind the apartment building. So. Um, I had a lot of theories about what that might be about, and I came to find out that the landlord had decided to dig a basement out illegally without a permit, and the building's been sinking ever since then. Luckily, I moved out last year into this uh, weird warehouse building, so, um, so yeah, but um, I think that that piece started me thinking about things started thinking about things that are of an underground nature that happen to happen underground, which leads me to um, 2003. Uh, back in 2003, this huge scandal occurred uh, when Chicago's mayor, Richard M. Daley, uh, mysteriously ordered the legal digging up of the runway of Miggs Field, which is this private, was this private uh, airport downtown in the middle of the night. And so this was post 9-11 and Mayor Daley cited security concerns. And I, I don't know if I bought that, um, but I saw this image appearing in all the newspapers and on TV of the big X marks in the runway. And I couldn't help but think that Daley's crew dug up the runway, the private runway legally, but they were looking for buried treasure, you know, X marks the spot. So then I started thinking about pirates. Um, and in 2005, I was invited to have a solo show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And I decided I wanted to make a piece for the MCA um, about Mixfield and about Mary Daly and pirates. And these were some of the books I was reading at the time to write the story. Um, of course, Nancy Drew is always in there um, and other things who runs Chicago. Um, so, uh, you know, um, about 12 feet into making the four, that 48 foot long drawing, um, the MCA curator emails me about the MCA director's concerns about me making a piece about Mayor Daly. And at the time, the MCA did not have a good relationship with the mayor and I panicked. And I had, this was my first museum show, the first thing I'd that I was really excited about and terrified about. And I had no images of the work in progress to share with the curator and the director. I hadn't even finished writing the piece. Um, so I, I thought, okay, I gotta come up with something that I can say. So I said to the curator to, to tell the director, I definitely have no intention of disparaging the mayor. Uh, this is a comical work of fiction. I hope the mayor comes to see the show and I hope he gets a laugh out of it. And, to me, and that seemed to satisfy the director of the museum, um, but to make the situation a bit more complicated, Daly's face was appearing on the cover of the local newspapers looking more and more distraught and disheveled. And because his offices uh, were being investigated by the feds at that time. So that leads me to the article, this article. Um, it leads me to the call I get from this Chicago Tribune reporter who says, rumor has it, you're making a critical piece about Mayor Daly and Miggs Field. And so I was so glad that I had my line that I could say that I had said to the curator to tell the director of the MCA 
the line, which is, I definitely have no intention of disparaging the mayor. This is a comical work of fiction. I hope the mayor comes to see the show and I hope he gets a laugh out of it. And that's what they ended up printing in the, the last you know, paragraph here. So, um, but then the pressure was on, uh, on me to make a nuanced piece for the MCA that wasn't gonna shut down the show. I didn't want the show to be shut down. Um, I didn't want it to be re uh, censored, um, but I realized you know, if I'm gonna make art about people who are alive, I need to be careful. So I adopted the voice of a naive narrator and I made the piece more ridiculously, uh, more ridiculous than I initially intended. So this is the piece, it's 48 foot long, 48 feet long. It's on a blue uh, photo backdrop paper, which is apparently not archival. <laughs> and there's a lot of blue whiteout. Uh, I, I was buying up a ton of blue whiteout just to correct mistakes in the piece. And then I ended up, I, there was no more blue whiteout to be found in the city of Chicago. So I had to mix my own uh, blue whiteout uh, acrylic with um, whiteout. And, um, but the synopsis of the piece is you, an insomniac worker, are convinced that pirates have infiltrated Chicago by digging elaborate tunnels beneath its buildings. Um, you attempt to warn the mayor, but discover the mayor, the, discover the pirates might be after the mayor's father's, uh, who was former mayor Richard J. Daly, mob bribe money secretly, secretly buried in a private airfield. And I should mention that the mayor, um, as far as I know, never did see the exhibition. The exhibition was never shut down, it was fine. Um, but while the piece was up, the mayor's daughter did visit the museum and was led around by an MCA staff member who steered clear of my piece. So, so nothing, nothing happened. Um, it, you know, something could have happened, but nothing happened. Um, but I wanna move on, I wanna talk about this, actually not this, but the building next to this. This is a building across the street from where I used to live on Division Street in Chicago in kind of a Wicker Park neighborhood area. And so this building, yes, this building is what I see out my window, but next to it is was a large industrial loft building, uh, which I'm not showing you a photo of because I'm too nervous to. So the industrial loft building uh, next to this one used to be owned by a commercial sculptor who used that space to manufacture large sculptures for trade shows. And through a mutual friend, I find out that this guy also did a certain type of work for a certain organization in Chicago and that I should never, ever, ever tell anyone about it. <laughs> so apparently the commercial sculptor had a lot of serious machinery and was paid by an organization, a certain organization to use his machinery to make bodies disappear that needed to be disappeared. And there are several other stories about this sculptor that uh, I'm familiar with, including an instance of someone finding a finger in a dumpster behind the sculptor's building. And I should again emphasize that the mutual friend the sculptor and I had in common told me to never ever ever tell anyone about any of this. And apparently I have not followed this advice because I'm telling you about it right now. Um, and I did end up making a piece about it which features the commercial sculptor. But I was too afraid to put an image of the commercial sculptor in the piece or mention his name in it, which I do know. And I know what he looks like. So I decided to cast famous international uh, um, art star Richard Serra in the role of the commercial sculptor in my drawing. And if you've ever watched the Art 21 episode with Richard Serra, you would agree with me that he comes across as some sort of perhaps hitman. I, I, I hesitate to say it, but there's something, there's something about him. Um, so this is a, this is a, this came after the Pirates piece. Um, this is a, a paranoia narrative that explores an alternate version of art history in which an emerging artist named Richard Serra makes the mistake of moving to Chicago to try and make it as an artist and failing miserably. Um, Sarah pragmatically puts his sculpture tools to use as a uh, hitman slash human butcher, butcher in the employ of the Chicago outfit, which is a certain Chicago organization. Um, Sarah's current assignment is to kill you, his neighbor, 
Sarah invites you to his sculpture studio with intent to kill, but only after he offers you a sandwich and he can get your feedback on his latest sculpture. So um, Richard Sarah makes an appearance again in a piece that I made right after that one, or actually a few years after that one. Um, and this was a piece that was um, installed in the lobby of the MCA um, with an initial narrative, which focuses on a semi-fictitious artist studio building in an industrial pocket of Chicago, my building. Uh, new developments to the story, uh, I would add them each every other week um, when the museum was close to the public and over the course of the exhibition and previously reported elements of the story were subject to change or disappear um, throughout the exhibition. So what you see on the top, that's what it looked like at one point, but then some of those stories went away and new stories uh, were, were, um, were written on top of them and, and illustrated on top of them. Uh, so a lot of things that happened around my studio building made it into the piece, um, such as the meth lab that was busted um, around the corner. Um, and I was a little worried about including this drawing of the meth cook uh, in because it's such a direct reference to him. Um, there isn't much of a removal. Um, and there were other things that were happening at night around the studio that went into the piece, uh, which, you know, if you ever want to know about, I can tell you. Um, but uh, one of the things that I would notice, I would look out my window, my studio win window, and notice this red car that post office uh, employees would load up with mail. And it was not a post office, an official post office um, vehicle. So I always wondered about that. And so the red, the red car makes it into the piece. Um, around that time, I had a notebook that disappeared and it had a lot of research about various drug lords, including Amado Carrillo Fuentes. And I had made, a, I had made a, an artist book about uh, Carrillo Fuentes and several drawings. And the strange thing around the time that the notebook disappeared was that um, I remember receiving some hits on my website from Carrillo Fuentes' hometown, which was concerning. Um, and then of course, Richard Serra. Richard Serra makes it into the piece. Um, um, one of the threads in this piece is the, this obsession that you, the narrator, are worried that Richard Serra will sue you for writing him into your last piece uh, as a failed sculptor earning a living butchering bodies for the Chicago outfit. So, and this also made it in the piece. This is something an art critic uh, wrote somewhat unflatteringly about my work around this time. So I put that in there too. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, people used to joke like, oh, when are, I, I never know, never know if Deb's gonna put me into the piece. Um, but, um, but since making this piece, I think I, I started to feel more inclined to make work about dead people. So I think I, I think I was genuinely concerned about this piece and some of the people that were alive and that could see it. And so um, I just sort of thought, okay, if I am gonna make work about people who are living, still living, I won't name them in the work or I'll name them, but I'll attempt to be careful about what I say or I'll make the piece so ridiculous that it's an obvious work of fiction um, or I could make uh, work about a dead leader, for example, as a way to talk about a leader or leaders that are living, which brings me to Jim Jones, who is dead, thankfully. Um, cult leader Jim Jones founded the People's Temple in Indiana uh, in the 1950s and moved the cult to uh, California in the 1960s. In 1974, Jones established Jonestown, an agricultural commune in Guyana, and you may already know this, um, but a lot of people don't. I find that concerning that this is not um, taught in, in, uh, in school. Uh, I, I, I don't know if this is in like a American history, a US history course, um, but it should be. Um, so uh, the commune ended in abruptly in 1978 when Jones, Jim Jones forced his followers to commit suicide by drinking a poisoned grape flavorade. Um, some of Jim Jones's followers came from my hometown of Davis, California, which is why it's always been on my mind, the story of Jim Jones. Um, two of the, his key members of his inner circle were from my hometown. I went to school with uh, a kid whose aunt was in the inner circle. 
Also, uh, my father was a professor of political science at University of Davis, uh, California Davis, and one of his former students who's on the left there, uh, Jackie Spear, she worked for US Congressman Leo Ryan at the time. There she is with Congressman Ryan on the left, um, who represented a district where many constituents lived who had family members at Jonestown. In 1978, Congressman Ryan and Jackie Spear and members of the press and concerned relatives uh, flew down to Jonestown to investigate, which led to several of them being killed by Jones's followers, including Congressman Ryan, but not Jackie. Right after this, Jones ordered his followers to drink the poison flavor aid, then ordered his own death. All of this resulted in the largest single incident of intentional civilian death in U.S. history until September 11th. Uh, one silver lining in the tragedy is Jackie did survive and is now the U.S. Congresswoman representing what was once uh, Ryan's congressional district and has served as a powerful voice in Congress against corruption and, and other abuses of power. Um, so I knew the story of Jim Jones. I knew the story at an early age. I, I always felt drawn to it, but I was also incredibly disturbed by it, um, especially by the mind control tactics that Jones successfully used on his followers and the great lengths he went to in order to manipulate and exert uh, influence over politicians and other people in positions of power and people in general. Um, this, by the way, a little tangent here, uh, a Northern Indiana restaurant, this is in 2011, uh, erected billboards referencing the 1978 Jonestown cult massacre in which um, more than 900 people died. And so they ended up having to remove the signs following the complaints that the signs were offensive. Um, yeah, we're like a cult with better Kool-Aid to die for. Um, so my, my thought was, and Jim Jones had, had been on my mind forever, what if in an alternate version of reality, Jim Jones or a Jim Jones-like figure ran for US Congress with his eye on the presidency or ran for president? Um, which brings me to this, this, um, this exhibition, uh, which was at the um, Wadsworth Athenaeum 2013, it was a site-specific story that unfolds through a series of sequential handwritten journal entries and drawings on, on panel and campaign posters and books and additional small-scale objects. Um, the author of the story, uh, an unnamed individual referred to as youth throughout the narrative, is a campaign worker who becomes increasingly concerned about the behavior of the candidate, Jim Jones, and the campaign's questionable tactics used to secure a win in an upcoming uh, congressional election. This briefcase with the code set to 666 was included in the exhibition. You see it on the bottom left there. Um, as the this was the brief, supposedly the briefcase of candidate Jim Jones's main campaign consultant David Copperfield. In an this is an alternate version of you know of history where David Copperfield instead of being a, a famous uh, master illusionist uh, magician ends up uh, being a campaign consultant for. A congressional candidate. Why not, right? Um, uh, the two things have something in common. Uh, while this exhibition was up, someone kept going into the room, into the exhibition, and changing the 666 on the briefcase to something else, which was not part of the plan. So, so, and and they kept having the, to to the curator kept having to say, "You need to switch it back to 666." <laughs> anyway. Um, so while the exhibition was on view, uh, we ended up hanging this banner on the facade of the Museum of the Wadsworth, which says, believe Jim Jones for Congress. And so the Wadsworth director at the time was concerned about the banner uh, potentially generating controversy due to Connecticut State Capitol being uh, within close proximity to the Wadsworth Museum and that when the exhibition opened, it was right after an election. And so the banner seems to promote a cult leader who ordered the mass suicide of 900 people. Um, and that was what the director was concerned about, but everything ended up being fine. Um, kind of like the MCA Mayor Daly piece. So that was like, you know, I, I, I seem to have skirted past, skirted by any controversy in both instances. Um, so this is an excerpt from the Warren Commission report uh, from 1964, which was, as you probably know, was established to investigate JFK's assassination. 
And this excerpt in particular is a psychiatric evaluation that my psychologist cousin Irving Sokolow, rest in peace, uh, conducted on Oswald in 1953. Um, my cousin did encounter Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, at the time, uh, young Oswald was living with his mother in New York City and had stopped attending school and was sent to psychiatric observation uh, for a psychiat psychiatric observation in the youth house, which is an institution for troubled youth. Um, this was about 10 years prior to Oswald supposedly assassinating Kennedy. And when the Warren Commission was investigating the assassination and tracked my cousin down, Irving told them, uh, and also years later told my dad, who told me that um, the, the commission attempted to coerce Irving into stating that Oswald acted alone in assassinating JFK, but Irving was steadfast in believing that Oswald was not smart enough to have acted alone, if he had acted at all in, in this. Um, so around that time, um, I was started to read more about JFK, um, kind of through this portal of my cousin Irving, having known uh, or encountered Oswald. Um, and that led me to Mary Pinchon Meyer, who I feel like people don't really know, know who that is and people should know. Uh, Mary Pinchon Meyer was an artist, a socialite, um, and a lover, confident, and unofficial policy advisor to John F. Kennedy in the last few years before his assassination. Pinchot Meyer was also killed under very similar circumstances to JFK uh, about a year after JFK, and there have been several accounts and items of evidence that point to the strong possibility that this was a hit most likely ordered by James Jesus Angleton, who was at the time counterintelligence chief of the CIA, and Angleton had, close, had told close friends um, that he was conducting surveillance on Mary. Um, Angleton was also a close friend of Pinchon Meyer's uh, ex-husband, Cord Meyer, also CIA, and there have been several accounts that point to the strong possibility that Angleton was also involved in JFK's murder. So that led me to make this drawing, and I kept thinking about Mary Pinchon Meyer being under surveillance. Uh, this drawing is an imagined schematic of Pinchon Meyer's Georgetown home, which includes Angleton's surveillance equipment hidden inside decorative rock sculptures uh, made with the guidance and encouragement of Angleton's art therapist that he gifted Pinchon Meyer. So yes, there is some embellishment there. Um, Angleton did, James Jesus Angleton did brag to close friends that he was conducting surveillance on Mary. So, so yes, that it, it's the, you, I think you can say, okay, the, the rocks didn't happen, but everything else did. <laughs> um, so, um, so this is a, a closer up version of the piece. You can see the decorative rock sculptures and supposedly there's surveillance, Angleton surveillance in them. Um, but I was having a show at that time at a gallery in Washington, DC, and I wanted to show this piece. And the gallerist said, absolutely not. And so it turns out that this gallerist was in the same circle of artists and art related friends that Mary Pinchon Meyer had, because don't forget Mary Pinchon Meyer was a, was a painter. She was an artist. She actually um, had an affair with uh, Kenneth Nolan before she had the affair with JFK. And so anyway, apparently this subject was off limits. Um, uh, and so, Eventually, I did ask the gallerist uh, who she thought killed Mary, and she was pretty clear about it being the CIA. Um, and she said that that's who all of Mary's friends thought did it. So, um, and also at that time, after the Pinchot Meyer piece, I was I was looking at um, a lot of drawings of um, like Joseph Albers and drawings of Donald Judd and kind of. You know, um, the, the, the Albers drawing on the left uh, was from, I think that was from a Morgan Library and Museum show, uh, a show um, not about finished products, but about the constant hands-on research and experimentation and correcting as you go. Um, and so there was something very, I connected to about that. And I kept thinking like, uh, I kept, reassessing or reevaluating the, the visuals that I was pairing with the text that I was writing in the work. And so I kept asking myself the question, like what kind of visuals 
would be appropriate for a semi-fictitious text. And so I started pairing the text with a mix of abstract shapes and diagrammatic visuals, um, some of which may are made to look like they um, are reproduced with the printmaking process, but instead everything is hand rendered with uh, colored pencils and crayons and functions as a, co a conceptual complement to the text and that they both contain uncertainties with regard to their fabrication. These are my studio walls. So, um, so that leads me to the last five years of what I've been up to, which looks a little bit more like this, these schematics. Um, they're kind of, they kind of reference or they are floor plans of various sites that things are taking place in or around. Um, in this piece, um, uh, this is this one, I'll read it. It's a little bit faint in the screen, but it reads, during the time when he called the White House home, his strong leadership would begin to falter, which Mr. Richard M. Nixon would attribute to the presence of oval rooms in the executive residence. Too many ovals emitted an excessive and seemly amount of expressive feminine energy. Mr. Richard M. Nixon ordered the oval rooms to be turned into rectilinear rooms to no avail. Reflecting upon his life post-presidency, Mr. Nixon was convinced that the ovals were mainly responsible for the road towards his impeachment. Um, so I think uh, here's where I'm in a happy place, where I'm making a, a piece about someone who's dead so they can't come and get me. Um, and the, the, I can be ridiculous. Um, I, think, I think working with that, the mix of fact and fiction, because there is some fact in here and there's certainly fiction. Uh, there's something, there's, there's a lot of freedom and it really opens up a lot of opportunities. Uh, I think if you're just sticking with facts, it can feel like homework, <laughs> I think, um, at least for me. And, um, you know, I always tell my students, um, you know, when, when we've got a research project, I sign them a research project and I say, but you're an artist, so you don't have to research like you might if you were in the hard or soft sciences. Um, research is really up to you, whatever that means. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I, I, I like this space where you have the freedom to, um, to, to move a, a narrative into a direction that um, is completely unexpected and, and perhaps semi-fictitious. Um, so these are some details of the Richard Nixon piece, the ovals, right, the ovals. Um, there's a little excerpt in here, only women experience hysteria, men do not experience hysteria, but what could this be, asked Mr. Richard M. Nixon. Um, uh, this is <laughs> this is um, this is called the Empty Museum. This is actually about someone who I did not name in the piece, um, and so um, and there's there's uh, almost very little. There, there's not a whole lot of fiction in this piece, but I will go ahead and read this. Uh, the famous architect designs a large new contemporary art museum. When built, it is received with wide acclaim. The architect prefers for the museum to remain empty for its first exhibition so that the building itself, an immensely significant and uncompromising work of contemporary art can exist as the sole feature of the museum for as long as possible. The director, a former curator who frequently exhibits visible disdain for art objects, finds this idea appealing. The art museum remains empty for its initial exhibition for an indefinite amount of time. After four years, the trustees begin to quietly doubt this arrangement, but eventually come around to the architect and curator's shared point of view, which is that the architect is a true genius. As such, his building, the Contemporary Art Museum, should be the singular item of art on display on a permanent basis. So um, I will leave it at that. Um, and then this is kind of a related piece. Um, this is. Uh, I don't mention the name of the curator that this is about, but it's very easy to find this because I put a, a, a citation in a footnote in the piece that tells you where to look. Uh, <laughs> so this is um, this text is uh, the floors are gray and so are all the surfaces closet items and kitchen utensils art objects do not agree with the curator as such none are allowed entry into the home. The international art curator prefers for art objects to also not enter the art museum he currently works at, but unfortunately, this is not entirely under his purview. There's my cat. The international art curator is currently interviewing for the director position of 
okay, Aaron Rodgers, give me a sec, of a new contemporary art museum in which he foresees its lack of art objects as a wonderful possibility. And the clue is right here on this screen to the, to the right there, the footnote number one, as described in the April 4th, 2017 profile in the New York Times. So you could go look that up and see who I'm talking about. Um, so I'm gonna move on. Um, uh, so yeah, I think, um, I think what, uh, this, is, this is just a little excerpt also from the piece. There is no color in the world outside. It does not come inside the condo. The visualization should help explain. So yeah, so this is, this is a piece about a curator that does not like art objects and has uh, no art objects and no color in, in, uh, in this person's condo, in their condo. So um, I'm gonna move on to uh, Mr. Ronald Reagan's post-presidential plans for a career in stand-up comedy. Um, you know, there, there is some truth to that, but I'm not gonna say what it is. Um, I'm not gonna parse apart the, the text and, and tell you. Um, uh, it is widely known that American Mr. Ronald Reagan enjoys standing and using a microphone in front of people as he frequently does during the entire eight year run of his presidency, a role which he, de he de debuts in 1981. Um, it should be mentioned that uh, Nancy Reagan, who excels in her supporting role as adoring first lady is decidedly not a supporter of the comedic arts in covert uh, consultation with the couple's main astrological advisor, Mrs. Nancy Reagan is pleased to learn that an intentional comedic career fails to positively align with Mr. Ronald Reagan's post-presidential planetary alignment. Um, so yeah, and then um, I'm gonna move on to, uh, and, uh, just an, I got two more, two more. Um, so uh, speaking about Frank Lloyd Wright, um, you know, at, for a while I was making work about the architect Frank Lloyd Wright um, and I would just refer to him as the architect because, you know, he, he's been he's been dead for a while, um, but I through mutual friends, I, I knew people who were connected to the foundation and and or people who were somehow uh, I, I was worried. I was actually genuinely worried that it wouldn't be a, a good idea to make so much work about Frank Lloyd Wright that might be um, perceived as as being disparaging and to use his name. But eventually, I just decided, you know what? This one, I'm just gonna. I I think I I think uh, I think I decided that it was okay again to use Frank Lloyd Wright's name. So. Um, so this is, this is a piece, um, yeah, this is Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright's idea for a body cleansing station inside the Guggenheim, which is actually, the funny thing is, is that that is this, almost everything here is entirely true. Um, the, and the only thing that I cannot remember if it's true or not is the final thing on the bottom here. But so, so it reads, during a 1945 press conference in New York City, American architect, uh, Mr. Funkler Wright unveils his designs for the museum's new building, including the inclusion of a mandatory full body uh, suction cleansing station inside the vestibule where visitors must clean themselves before stepping foot inside the museum. That is entirely true. Um, this was a surprise to all of the apprentices that were there for the big unveiling of the maquette. And they all looked at him like he had jumped the shark because no, he had not ever said anything about a cleansing station in the vestibule with a full body suction cleaning, cleansing station inside the vestibule that people would have to go through before entering the Guggenheim Art Museum. And so, and it was, I don't even think it was included in the maquette. It was just something that Frank Lloyd Wright said in the moment. And so, um, and I thought that's amazing. That's so strange. And so, but the, the last sentence here, there will be no, this quote, there will be no drooling down the surface of the Guggenheim, uh, Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright announces, I'm going to confess to you that I cannot remember if that is true or not. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I can't say that I always remember where the line is between the so-called facts and the fiction. Um, so uh, yes, gas from the architect's apprentices and attendants seem to confirm that Mr. Frank Lloyd Wright has gone off script and he really did. 
that is entirely true. Uh, and then I think I want to, I think I want to end, um, hold on, I have to get my cat, sorry. Oh my gosh, she just wants treats, so apologies, she just wants treats. Uh, I think I'm going to end here just to have some uh, room for any questions or any comments. Um, but uh, this is, a, so, so this is a story, um, Mr. Kim Jong-un uh, attempts to kidnap Mr. Michael Jordan. Um, yes, I thought about whether I should make work about Kim Jong-un and whether Kim Jong-un's people will ever track me down. And I really think I have nothing to worry about. Um, I think for the most part, I probably should have nothing to worry about, but um, you know, you never know um, if you might offend someone. So, uh, so this is this is an excerpt from it. Um, schematics for kidnapping Mr. Mr. Michael Jordan prepared by uh, Mr. Kim Jong Un's people for Mr. Dennis Rodman to carry out. So Dennis Rodman is going to carry out the kidnapping um, meditation room inside uh, Mr. Dennis Rodman's mansion for asking truthful questions, such as why doesn't anyone want to kidnap me? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to move on to this final image, and one of these three is true, and, um, and I would just let all of you decide which one it is, or, or guess. Um, one of them is entirely true. Um, so, uh, the piece came about because, um, because Kim Jong-un had, was obsessed um, with Michael Jordan and still is and was a huge fan of the Chicago Bulls and I just thought that was fascinating and um, so yes I maybe that's too much of a clue but one of these three is correct so um, so yeah I think uh, I think I'm gonna uh, go ahead and end the talk there if that's okay Ben oh Ben you're on yeah. mute yeah, there's no, yeah, you can end anytime you like. We can. <laughs> I did a lot of talking, so, <laughs> so, so yeah. Any questions uh, or comments, you just put your name in the uh, chat and uh, they will take them in order. Um, so do you think this kind, the kind of fiction that you're adding to some of these stories is what goes on in, in the mind of most conspiracy theorists or people who sort of just move beyond, you know, um, provable fact and, but it, but to them, it makes sense. Possibly. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I, I have, I have switched gears. I think I'm, I've selected a cer certain work to show today, but there's a lot of work that I did not show that okay. enters more into or, or focuses on various conspiracy theories. I'm not a conspiracy theorist myself, but, um, but I, I think uh, I'm of the feeling that conspiracy theories in general have, and maybe they've always been, um, but they just seem so incredibly, um, oops, my cat is attached to me, so uh, incredibly um, racist and uh, uh, xenophobic. And um, so I think I've really moved away from them. I think uh, the, only, the only conspiracy theories that I, would, that I used to make work about um, uh, were, were ones that had that I thought there was something humorous about them. Um, and but if something is so, so horrible, I'm definitely not gonna make work about it if there yeah, if there's if there's nothing in there that that um, is remotely <laughs> humorous or bizarre. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, uh, I think I've moved away from that. Um, and I think I've moved away a bit from making work about politicians. Um, I think the last couple of years have really worn me out. Um, it seemed like the Jim Jones piece was uh, a precursor to, to, um, to, to uh, a certain um, 
yeah, presidential administration. I don't know. Um, but there, oh, there's a question in the chat. Um, do you think Lombardi was a suicide? Absolutely not. Um, of course, maybe that's what a conspiracy theorist would say. Um, but I, I think it's I think it's really too um, the timing is too strange. And when he was making that last piece, um, the piece that um, the Whitney, I think it was the Whitney that bought it in. Uh, it was after 9-11 and, and the FBI wanted to see that piece, wanted a private viewing of that piece um, because it talked about the Bin Laden family and connected the Bin Laden family just financially uh, to other entities. Um, and that was the, and, and also Bush was in that piece too, I think. Um, so it just seems that the, the, just the timing was kind of strange for for the suicide so no i i didn't i don't buy it and also i think the way that um whatever was around i'm trying to remember yeah no i'll i'll leave it at that i'll leave it at that um <laughs> and then uh let's see oh what inspires you um oh, if you uh if you um end your sharing okay you oh, see yeah. the other people Okay, yeah, no. I think you could ask your questions and. Yeah, I, I didn't know if anyone wanted to make a guess though on the on that final slide. Oh, Other... oh right, did anybody? Oh my gosh, my cat, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, what inspires me? Um, everything, uh, except for some things, like maybe conspiracy theories are no longer <laughs> inspiring me, um, but, um, and I find that politics is is inspiring me inspiring me a lot less and less. Um, I guess the things that I'm I'm really interested in right now are in our architecture, and how strange architects are, and um, the architect god complex. And um, yeah, I think that's what I've been focused on lately. Um, and it, it's institutional architecture. It's the architecture of the home. I've been obsessing over my home a lot during pandemic. So of course, that's my focal point. Um, I have this lovely view into all these um, people's apartment windows across the street. So I'm, I've been, of course, can't help but make stories about them. So these are, yeah, these are the things that are inspiring me right now. Um, the next question is, how did you accomplish the before and after for the piece that you altered as the shore went on? Did you cover up parts? Or actually remove and replace them. Excellent question. Um, I gessoed over the parts that I decided to get rid of, and then uh, and then I would um, when it would dry, I would add the new something new on top of it. Um, so yeah, I, I would yeah the, those things would disappear. Um, so, but I, I liked the idea that it could be like this story that is alive and evolving and full of multiple stories and, and you know, that it was all gonna stay on that one long, or th those panels um, throughout the course of the exhibition. So let's see, what else? Yeah. These people can ask the questions, you know, with their, in their voice, speak oh, them if they like to. Yeah. You don't have to write the question. I mean, just put your name in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Samantha wants to ask that. Yeah, uh, what are you working on now? Is there something cooking in your studio that you're especially excited or nervous about? Um, well, I just finished a commission um, for, this is so funny, uh, uh, a, a lawyer whose father was the lawyer for Richard M. Daly. <laughs> and, and it's not, it wasn't a piece about Daly. It was a, a piece about the, uh, yeah, about the current, well, not really the current mayor, but a mayor of Chicago. And anyway, uh, but that, but I'm, I'm right now, I'm really, fo again, focused on architecture. Uh, I know it sounds weird. It sounds so not me, maybe, but um, and I'm, there's something about the built environment and all the subjective aspects of it, uh, all the, um, the, the, the agendas that go into deciding how a building is built or what materials are it's made of or how it gets used and how it gets altered. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually really excited about that. Um, 
and not nervous, just excited, just excited. And, and they're, they're small drawings and some of them are larger. Um, so yeah. Um, ah, thanks, Deb. Always interested to see, learn about your work and your cat. Oh my gosh, my cat really, she really made an appearance. Um, she's also deaf, so she cannot magic. She doesn't know how loud her meows are, so apologies for everyone. Uh, I would love to hear more about your process, how you approach writing, um, or I know you have many scraps in your studio. How do the writing and visuals come together? Um, lately, they've been really independent of each other, and then they start to merge. Um, so I, I'm, I'm reading a lot. I just read a book about, it's called The, um, the Burglar's Burglar's Guide to the City. And so it's looking at a um, urban landscape or uh, houses or structures from the point of view of a burglar, um, which is fascinating to me. And, um, and I'm, I'm just working on um, experimenting a lot with um, layers of materials and color and shapes and uh, maquette-like structures. So um, trying to build um, you know, little uh, walls to to differentiate the walls of a building or the rooms of the building. Um, and actually the text has kind of, um, I've been removing it from the work to some extent, um, having a lot less text lately. Uh, I think partly because my eyesight hasn't been as good as it used to be. <laughs> I have a hard time writing. Um, it takes so much uh, focus and my eyes just sort of, you know, die after a while. Um, so I've been putting less text in the work um, or having the text be in the title. Um, let's see, uh, I hope that answers. I think number three was right. I think you're wrong, <laughs> Greg. Uh, Debbie, Debbie Dodge, you got it. Number one is correct. Um, uh, I don't know if I should share, show, show number one again. Um, just for a sec, I'll show. So yes, uh, number one is correct. Uh, visualization of basketball being cradled in bed at night by Mr. Kim Jong-un as a child while dreaming of shooting, shooting hoops with American basketball hero, Mr. Michael Jordan. Yes, he did cradle a basketball at night that was a special like Bulls basketball. It may have had Michael Jordan's signature on it. Um, and that's how he would fall asleep. Um, so uh, now you know the answer. Um, and oops, okay. Okay, so um, let's see, anything? Diane has a question, I'm trying to unmute her. Sorry, I've unmuted yeah. myself. Okay. Um, hi, I, uh, well, I have a lot of very strong thoughts and feelings on this and I don't wanna be a killjoy, but I wonder whether, for example, this recent election season has caused you to have any, reflect differently on these complicated, I mean, what seem to you to be obvious stories, we clearly have a very sizable population that cannot tell that insanity is not real. So I wonder whether you might be rethinking you know, what is a reasonable line and what people can and can't see and so on. And that's also, you know, what that, whether that gives you different kinds of responsibilities, uh, you know, to be sort of not a uh, provocateur of, you know, of, of violence, because you are, you, you know, the, the stories you're telling do involve, you know, criminal activity, do involve people dying, da, 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 da. I mean, it's not as though, you know, it's about killing flowers or, uh, you know, um, I mean, these are, you know, you're, you're dealing at extremes of human behavior. And so, um, anyway, that's question one of, I, the others are, anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, you're right. Uh, I, I have been um, removing myself from some of those topics, um, although mainly because I've been exhausted and also because everything I was talking about to me has come true in a, in a way. Like there's so many aspects of things like that uh, are now um, like the, the Jim Jones piece, um, you know, having uh, someone in charge uh, with such abuse of power um, and uh, really manipulating uh, followers and everyone around them and I, I, to me, that I will never make anything like that again. It's already, it's already here. 
So um, I used to, when I started out making art about things and, and working in a narrative vein, it was to reveal things that were hidden, that I thought were hidden. And when something is no longer hidden, I don't wanna make work about it. So I think that's where I'm coming from and why I've moved away from it, but also just from exhaustion. And I think to your, your point about like what, you know, personal responsibility about these topics, um, I think in a sense, I, because I'm working with illustration, because I'm working in on with drawings, I actually feel like, um, you know, I'm not taking photographs. I'm not making a, a political speech. Um, I'm in the space of art. And I think it's the way I always talk about my work is that it's a mix of fact and fiction. I never say it's all factual. So I think right there, um, sorry. <laughs> I think right, I think right there, I think that's my responsibility to always mention that. Um, and beyond that, I'm, I'm, you know, not necessarily going to stop making work um, because people might think it's true. Um, but what about, you know, what about th those people who have taken care not to be those kinds of people you paint them as? I mean, what we've also seen, right, is, is people not being able to tell the difference, right? And we also, I mean, cognitive science reveals all the time that people are faster to believe the negative, people are faster and much more inclined to believe false stories. Once people have false stories in their heads, they're very hard to get rid of and showing them facts often reinforces those beliefs. I'm not sure, I'm not convinced, frankly, that even moving and it, a more responsible tack is taking on the, the dead because they have no, they can't defend themselves. I mean, why not, if, you're going, if you wanna play with fiction, I wonder, for example, why not, instead of using the name Richard Serra, develop, why not develop about an entirely fictional, why not fictionalize entirely the person you're talking about, but perhaps make the work more, uh, you know, the, maybe take reality more from the kinds of social dynamics you're talking about. You know what I mean? That way, one is in less, because the problem is, and, and I'm, forgive me, and I'm sorry if I sound, these are only my opinions, but, you know, um, they come from sort of also understanding how the brain works and also working in some of these spaces myself and, and feeling also very beholden to trying to do these things in ways that are ethical, right? Uh, and but at the same time, you know, um, images, even if those images stick in the mind much more more than words do, right? I mean, that's that's what why so much of what you know communicators work in the world of imagery because it 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 lasts in the brain more than words do. Anyway, I've just I, I, these are just my views, not yours. But I forgive me for. Uh, you know, wanting to query some of the choices you're making or, or ask you to think about them if, if, if people haven't kind of poked at you a bit about them before, because I think, you know, we have seen just, you know, with the last four years we've seen and the fact that they are not over. And, you know, the, the questions regarding how we talk about people, you know, these lines that we used to believe about what is real and what is not real are so, so murky now and, you know, the way people are also frankly trying to pass give themselves passes out of doing you know real things by saying claiming their stories anyway I'll, I'll, that's that's what i've right okay well that that is exhausting <laughs> um i think you know in you in yes i think you bring up good points and and i i read a lot of fiction and I more and more, I view what I do as within the space of fiction more than it ever has been before. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of fiction that um, talks about people that exist. Um, I'm thinking about Don DeLillo's book um, about Lee Harvey Oswald, a fictionalized version of Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, I think it's clear it's fiction I think um, lots of TV shows uh, are fictionalized accounts of um, people that have existed or are still alive. Um, I'm watching The Crown right now, and it's already come out like, yes, this is a very exaggerated, or there are things in this that are not true. 
Um, I think to shut it all down would be wrong. I think there's, I think there's a place for creative expression that can take uh, aspects of reality of actual people, whether they are alive or dead and fiction and put them together. And I think that's fine. I would never want that to go away. I can't be held responsible for people who uh, seem to have problems with uh, reality. Um, and so I, I would put that out there too. Um, you know, I, many people have read things that I've said that I've made and, and, and it's not so much that they come up with conclusions, but they ask questions. And that's kind of a great place. I think I couldn't ask for anything better uh, for someone to come away with something that I made and have questions and maybe do a little bit of research on their own um, rather than come, than come away from something that I made and have a, a strong conclusion about that person or whatever it is I'm talking about. So um, I would never make a piece that would attempt to shut down a conversation uh, and end in a conclusion about something um, or a judgment. Um, so, so yeah, I, that's, that's perhaps that's the best answer I can give you off the cuff. Um, but those are things I do think about uh, for sure. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, uh, okay, the next question. What other work that combines words and pictures do you follow? Technical manuals, absolutely. Um, a key directions for putting together a bookshelf the wrong way, yes. Um, I mean, I think anything that where where it's like a it looks like a schematic, um, anything that is uh, attempting to explain something and then ha have have some sort of schematic visual. I mean, I'm always more interested in in making a drawing uh, of something that could exist but will never ever be built. Um, I know a lot of artists make schematic drawings for something that is intended to be built, but I like the space of speculation a little bit better. Um, so uh, I'm thinking of Los Carpinteros that where they, they've made like uh, a, a drawing uh, or a watercolor of a, a, a really uh, insane basketball court where you can never play basketball on it, but then it was built, uh, which I love. But I think uh, I never necessarily want anything that I've made a drawing of to be built. <laughs> But uh, let's see, next question. Oh, that's nice. Um, oh, okay. Um, all right, I think that's it. Um, I don't know, does anyone have any other questions? No, I don't see any. Um, you know, in, in, in fiction, you routinely put a legal disclaimer in front of your book because I mean, there were cases where someone thinks they're making something up and it turns out that's somebody's life. And then they turn around and said, I mean, and you, if they have the money, they can uh, take somebody to court. I mean, but the, I think it has to do with what percentage seems mm -hmm. intentional rather than saying it was unintentional. Um, so, no, but I, but I think... Um, I think that's why I asked that question, because I think when you read the news or learn about things, your mind could go off and say, well, what about that? I mean, <laughs> that might be part of the story that we're just not hearing. We're not hearing the whole story. And you know it's a fabrication, but you still do it. I mean, I, that's why I don't know if, that's, if that is the impulse behind um, behind the uh, theoretical, you know, um, embroidery of, of reality. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think you just hang a little disclaimer and then people will say, it's obviously this is meant to be an embroidery of fiction, <laughs> you know, something you read and you went to sleep and you had a dream about this something. I mean, how can that be? Again, I mean, it can only be against the law if the person you're dealing with thinks it's, uh, you know, a libelous in some way. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, they can take you to court, I mean. <laughs> but, 
Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I. But I, I think I, I don't know what the I'm not a you know maybe there's a lawyer here, but somebody <laughs> could say what how what use that legal disclaimer is. Um, but uh, if that really protects somebody, but. Uh, I mean, I I think you you would be taking away so many. You know, if, if there would be there would be so fewer TV shows if this were, you know, uh, I, I'm just thinking about so all the all the books, all the fiction, all the the mm -hmm. so much fiction is actually semi fictitious. Um, you know, they, I mean, well, yeah, nobody's reinventing the whole right. world. They're using right. elements of the world, how the world works. But I think it's the you know maybe as you said the context has a lot to do with it. If it's in the context of a um, piece of imaginative work. Um, this is great. You know, I mean, journalists, that they live with that. They're telling the truth and their, their lives are completely hounded by people because they don't want the truth to come out. So, you know, the opposite is saying this is not true. <laughs> I mean, it's just as dangerous, probably, on some mm -hmm. level. It's, I but, think you're uh, right. I mean, the, the truth, context, you know, the context is really important. Yeah, so. the truth doesn't protect you just because you say it's true. <laughs> That's what all, um, all real investigative journalists are doing, and they get in a lot of trouble if they don't get murdered. I mean, so, <laughs> so uh, Oh, yeah, it's a strange, um, yeah. I mean, I just know journalists and I know that that's the bane of their existence. If you write about a real person, they're going to follow you for the rest of their life and think you had some, whether good or bad impact on their life. And so, um, yeah, it's much safer to clearly push it into the world of fiction and people can, I mean, somebody, things can happen, but generally people will say, it's not my name. It, there are enough things that are different that it's probably, mm -hmm. it works like my life maybe, but it's not, mm -hmm. I can't uh, say it's ruining my life or something. But, so uh, anyway. Uh, oh, the best uh, lies are based on truth. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the so best, do you best. think some, when you read investigative journalists, do you think something really fundamental is missing because they don't have that graphic, you know, that kind of um, spatial drama happening in their writing? Because it's just words. Is that, I mean, that seems to be the impulse behind yeah. it, to put a graphic. Um, Absolutely. Um, facial thing around it. it. It is hard to, sometimes it, I know I would love to have maps accompany every, you know, or, or schematics accompany every, you know, investigative yeah. journalist um, piece. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, cause in, and we all um, absorb information uh, or, or are able or, or learn about it differently. Right. Um, you know, some of us are, some people are more visual. Some people, you know, I, I need I need a map. I need I need visuals uh, for sure. Um, uh, photos are great, uh, <laughs> but but yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> this is so funny. Wait, we have the best lies are based on truth. Yes, and then or they or they just get repeated enough to sound true. Yes. <laughs> Uh, at one point, my cat and yours yelled at the same time competition. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think uh, any other questions or comments? No? Okay, I know it's oh. dinner time in Chicago. Yeah, it's, <laughs> otherwise I'm, I'm dinner time in Chicago, so, you know, okay. yeah. Great. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everyone who came. Nice. It, yeah. yeah. Competition. I love the cats. The cats yelling at the same time. I love that. Thanks, everybody, everyone. Uh, 
Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Ben.